Hello there booktube, my name is Daniel, welcome back to my channel, Guilty Feet. I've got no rhythm. Uh, today I'm going to talk about five uh, uh, recent reads which I found disappointing. Uh, this is not uh, uh, rants about books that I've hated or that have offended me. These are books that I was excited to read each of them for different reasons. Most of them uh, authors that I read before, one a subject that I was really interested in, and for various reasons were a little disappointing. Uh, and, you know, I think I'm often quite enthusiastic about the books I read. I think I'm very careful about curating the books I read. So I try and, you know, occasionally try something new and that could be disappointing, an exciting new author or a, a you know, first novel or um, uh, th so there can be disappointments along the way and stuff that I don't know. But uh, um, in between, I read a lot of repeat authors. I go back to the well uh, in several genre for several authors. And, and so I have certain expectations. So um, occasionally you can get disappointed. It's not a terrible thing. I think even your most beloved author will put out amongst their books, will put out a book that didn't do it for you. Um, and, you know, each time you make a decision, well, does this mean I'm going to stop if I'm in a series? And the book, the next book in the series, I read it and it's not great. Do I stop reading the series? If it's an author that I've read before that I've enjoyed and I've been buying their books every single time when they publish something new and I read one that doesn't really work for me, does that put me off reading the, reading the author? Uh, um, may uh, factor into the next time uh, um, I find a book on sale. Who knows? But I thought I'd present five you know, uh, books that I thought I might like more than I did. None of them are terrible. They all have something to recommend them. But for me, they were a little disappointing. I'll start with one of perhaps one of the most surprising ones of all. There's an author where I've read every single one of her novels. I've read um, uh, um, a set of essays. I've read a very slim thing that had two short stories in it. And so I thought I was on solid ground with Zadie Smith's Grand Union, which is a collection of short stories, uh, many of which have been published uh, elsewhere. Uh, usually this, right? Is this where they first appeared? Somewhere, either the front or the back. First appeared in Granta magazine, first appeared in New Yorker, first appeared in the Paris Review. Okay, so these are not written specifically for this collection, for the most part, but uh, um, some some short stories that Zadie Smith had in the hopper. Um, I like short stories. I really like Zadie Smith. I just found this collection um, less satisfying. Um, it didn't really do it for me. Maybe I came to it at, at not the right time. I, um, I think I was, it was just before, it was a couple of months ago, but just before we were going on holiday. And so I wanted to finish it before I went away. What, for whatever reason, um, uh, this this collection didn't really work for me. There's no particular standout stories in my in my memory. Some of them are quite brief, so it's the whole book is uh, 240 pages, and there is one, uh, five, ten, fifteen, so twenty odd uh, stories. So you know that's what ten, twelve pages a story uh, on average. So it, it's not that I got bogged down in any of them particularly. Just the whole thing as a collection was a little disappointing. Will I read Zadie Smith again? Yes, definitely. Um, I'll read whatever novel she puts out. I think there's some uh, essays of hers that I haven't read yet. I feel free. There may be another collection of short stories. One second, let me, that I haven't read. Uh, so the fiction, White Teeth, The Autograph Man on Beauty, NW, The Embassy of Cambodia, I think is a, is a short story. So I've read all those. A non-fiction, Changing My Mind, Occasional Essays and Feel Free. So there's two books of, of non-fiction essays. And I read Intimations, which came out during the pandemic, which is very short. Uh, so I made, you know, I, I, I still love Zadie Smith. I will still read uh, more of her work. This one didn't really work for me. Uh, next one is kind of interesting because I started a new project last year, which was to read Emile Zola's The Rougon Macar um, um, Cycle, 20 volumes in all. Um, and um, there are some people suggest you read them in publication order or there's a, I think Zola himself put out an order which he thought they should be read in. I decided to go with publication order. I think I think I remember that correctly. And this is the second one. So I read the first one, which I was great and really got me enthusiastic about buying more. And this was a little slower, um, a little incestuous. You think it's something spicy uh, um, that would be uh, titillating and exciting, but it was just a bit of a slog. The relationships uh, the relationship between the two main characters, um, a stepmother and her stepson, uh, um, and it just played out. I mean, yes, 
obviously there was the whole thing where the stepson sort of gets away scot-free and the stepmother's life is, is utterly ruined. Um, um, that, that sort of uh, misogynist uh, um, view of the world. But the, it, it should have been light and fluffy about Parisian society and just found it a bit of a slog. Uh, um, 250 pages. So, I, you know, I'm loving the fact that I can read these Victorian novels and they're not trollop-sized 800 pages each time. So I think I will definitely pick up the next one at some point in the next six months and, and uh, go on. But if uh, um, I have another bad experience, I may suspend my uh, Rougon Macar project. Um, so The Kill, or La Curée, I think it's uh, was uh, uh, um, in the original French, um, not as great as, my, as the first one, and giving me pause a little about this uh, project, which is due to last me the next 20 years of my life. Uh, we'll see, two in, second one, not as great as the first. Um, here's another example of a series uh, and this is uh, Lawrence Block's A Time to Scatter Stones. I've read, I think, 15, 16 books in the uh, Matthew Scudder series. He's a, a private detective, an ex-cop. He's a recovering alcoholic, uh, um, and Block has been very careful um, to not draw parallels to his own life. He says there's a reason why it's uh, um, one of the A's in AA is anonymous, and so he doesn't talk about whether this reflects any of his own life. But Scudder, we've traced over 20, 30 years um, 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 as a private eye in New York, getting his life together, um, finding a love later in life, um, uh, a former uh, um, uh, prostitute called Elaine, and they have a very um, genteel, loving relationship um, that, that develops over the books uh, into his retirement. Um, and Scudder, I think, one of the one of the few cops in the series who sort of ages in real time, so that by by the end of the, the last full novel, he, I think he's in his sixties at least, um, and Elaine uh, um, within ten years of him. So they are a, a late middle aged couple living their lives in New York, um, and the series wound up um, uh, uh, after uh, fifteen sixteen novels. I think the last one was a flashback to an earlier part of his life, and we thought we'd seen the end of Scudder. And uh, uh, he came out, I think, about 10 years after the last novel, with this, A Time to Scatter Stones, where we revisit Scudder and Elaine um, living in their apartment in comfortable retirement in New York. Um, uh, uh, Elaine has joined a group, uh, Scudder still goes regularly to his AA meetings, and Elaine has joined a group of um, former um, sex workers uh, who they, they can talk about their experiences and, and their lives uh, afterwards and, and uh, um, it's all very uh, wholesome and lovely. And uh, one of um, uh, the women that Elaine meets with has a problem and Elaine suggests that perhaps uh, Matt Scudder, former PI uh, man in his 60s, could help her with this problem uh, where she's being stalked. So uh, Scudder agrees to meet the uh, uh, young woman and uh, um, tracks down who the man is who's been stalking her and deals with him in a fairly unforgivably brutal way. Um, and then, uh, this is uh, entering spoiler territory, but just to give you the heads up of why this book was a little spoiler, then in the last 15 pages, to thank um, Elaine and uh, uh, Matthew Scudder for helping with her problem, the woman agrees to have a threesome with him. Uh, uh, came a little bit out of left field for me, um, and you know, uh, just an odd little novella featuring someone who was fairly hard-boiled New York detective that ends up to be a bit of a sex romp. Um, that was A Time to Scatter Stones by uh, Lawrence Block, uh, part of the Matt Scudder series ostensibly, but a sort of weird, sexy cul-de-sac. Um, another book, uh, uh, an author that I started reading only recently, and the first two of her novels uh, absolutely blew me away. I've been recommending them to everyone and, and working my way through uh, um, other books or trying to work out what the next book I should read because I didn't, I don't think I read them in order, which is how I often came to authors, backlist authors. I would start at the beginning and work my way through, even if it wasn't a series. Um, this is an author that I, I just, I read a couple of novels and this was seemed to be the next off the rank for me. Uh, and this was uh, Death Comes uh, for the Archbishop by Willa Cather. And again, it just was a bit of a chore. I had such a great experience with O Pioneers and My Antonia, really transcendently wonderful novels. And this didn't, didn't do it for me at all. It's a um, 
repetitious life of a, um, a, a an archbishop, a, a sent from the, the uh, uh, I think it's originally French speaking, not Spanish speaking, and, and the, all the bishops gathered together in Rome and send him out to deal with the uh, um, uh, the uh, Spanish speaking um, poor in uh, America, um, in New Mexico. Uh, try to it says it revitalize its slumbering Catholicism. So it's just a sort of colonialist bent to the whole project, uh, um, which I was sort of queasy making. Um, and then the book itself is kind of dull. Look at all these quaint poor people, and uh, only only Catholicism can come in and save them. And and isn't his life noble for agreeing to live among the savages and and give them the benefit of organized religion uh, um, uh, uh, in the only ways they can these poor illiterate. Uh, um, um, humans can understand yeah tiresome a little bit and a real shame I say I had a great experience with Lecafa, uh, uh previously uh, uh, since found out she's you know, I was a bit of an anti-Semite but that seems to be part of the course in a whole bunch of old books that I read um, uh, but uh, yeah this was disappointing I think I will try another Willa Cather because those first two experiences were so good so I'm not sure this will stop me but I, I'm going to try and pick carefully what the next Cather novel I read is, because I didn't love that at all. Uh, um, and the last book which I found disappointing was really disappointing that I found disappointing because I was really looking forward to this. Um, and and I, I want to be clear, distinguish between the subject matter and the book itself. So this is called Why We Kneel, How We Rise by Michael Holding, uh, a name probably won't be familiar to many of uh, uh, um, you watching. So let me give you some background. Michael Holding is a West Indian uh, um, cricketer, a retired West Indian cricketer, a man now in his late 60s. Um, uh, he was known, his name in, uh, he was a bowler, uh, um, which would be the equivalent of a baseball pitcher, someone who throws the ball. Uh, uh, that was his skill more than a, a batsman. Um, but in cricket, everyone does everything. Uh, um, and he was known as uh, his nickname. Uh, he was a feared, feared cricketer in his own right. And he was part of one of the most devastating international cricket teams of all time. Uh, um, he played for the West Indies. Um, and uh, um, he, uh, his nickname as a cricketer was Whispering Death because he was he is six foot four and would power in quietly, silently speeding onto the wicket and bowling the ball at you and was um, um, must have been absolutely terrifying to be at the other end of the batsman trying to fend off these uh, fast balls as I say, part of an entire bowling unit which dominated uh, world cricket for uh, um, a good amount of time. Um, it, since retiring from international cricket, he's uh, made a name for himself as a commentator uh, and currently employed by Sky Sports, which has the uh, rights to broadcast international cricket or in, when England play international cricket Sky Sports um, um, broadcasts it in the UK so he's part of the the commenting commentating team a um, couple of years ago uh, uh, when uh, George Floyd was murdered in the US uh, and the Black Lives Matter um, uh, uh, group uh, um, uh, gained uh, notice and the movement was spreading around the world there was uh, so, so Michael Holding and another cricketer, uh, a woman cricketer called Ebony Rainsford, uh, Rainford Brent, uh, who was a very prominent uh, um, uh, woman cricketer in the England cricket team. Um, together, they made they both commentators for Sky Sports, and together they made a fifteen minute um, um, film that was shown in the break in the cricket, uh, uh, where they spoke about um, institutionalized racism in sports, particularly their sport of cricket. Um, Michael Holding as a West Indian cricketer, and he talks about how growing up in the West Indies, he didn't necessarily feel racism, but then as he traveled the world as an international cricketer in Australia, to an extent in the UK uh, and all over, he spoke about his experiences with racism. Uh, Ebony Rainford Brent uh, spoke about as a, as a woman uh, coming into cricket, as a black woman coming into cricket, uh, um, what that was experience was like for her. It's a very powerful documentary, and I'm going to, 15 minute film that was shown in the in the in the break, uh, um, and I will link to it below because it's powerful, very affecting, and definitely worth watching even uh, two years on. No reason why that would have changed. Um, after the film was shown for the first time in Sky Sports, Holden was there and he was interviewed by uh, his colleagues, um, and he was visibly. 
um, affected by this film that he he'd made, and he he was in it, so he knew. It. But in in talking about it again, he got very emotional on camera, and it was a very powerful moment. So a grown man talking about uh, um, what what was going on in America and the response around the world. Um, he went on the news the next morning and was very emotional, and it was it was a real moment. From that moment, somebody said, "Oh, Michael, you should write a book." This is that book, um, and it is compared to the film he made and his um, um, live conversation interactions with his colleagues. It, this is just a little bit lightweight. It's padding. It's it's ghost written. The, the ghost writer is is name checked here. Um, oh, one second. Uh, Ed Hawkins has worked on this book with Michael Holding. I just don't think it ever transcends its origins as a oh that was a moment. People saw that. We should try and extend that moment by by putting a book out. Um, uh, just light, padded stories that we've heard before. St some of the stories that he told in the in the video, none of it really hang together. Not terribly well put together. Um, uh, the highlights of this is he interviews uh, and uh, um, a bunch of. Um, uh, uh, sporting celebrities from around the world. So he interviews Usain Bolt, he interviews Naomi Osaka um, uh, and other celebrities I should name, name some of those, some of them who, who I wasn't familiar with. Uh, Michael Johnson, the Olympian, uh, um, and Thierry Henry, the, 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 uh, the um, uh, footballer, and the, uh, one or two others. Uh, the interviews are the strongest part. Um, I think the connecting tissue, um, the sort of ghost-written padding uh, with Michael Holding and, and uh, his ghostwriter, that just really felt unnecessary or just thing. Uh, but even the interviews are kind of presented clumsily. Um, he, he repeat, he, he go, mentions several times how these are being done on Zoom. Not that that would make any difference because this was, you know, this was pandemic times. Um, and it just, the repeat speech is all reported instead of actually in, in that. It's just, it's just a very sort of awkward, clumsy book about a, an important subject. I say, this has nothing to do my, my disappointment with the book is with the form itself. I bought this, I thought I was going to really like it. The whole thing was a little disappointing, but the subject, fabulous, the interviews, fabulous. Um, and I think rather than spend your time on this, um, watch the video that I've linked to below. So five books that I was just dis disappointed. Doesn't put me off reading because next book may be an absolute banger. Uh, um, take care, God bless, bye.